Welcome to this new tutorial about Fixed Networks, a computer model for Satisfactory. Today we're going to talk about the modular control panels and network signals. Currently there are two types of control panels, the large vertical control panel and the large control panel. Modular control panels are used to be able to place buttons and a variety of, of different buttons, switches and controls and displays onto a grid which you can fully customize where you want to place some stuff. You can now address these via the computer network to do different things with them. First of all we have to get a reference to the control panel. So for that we create a new panel variable and store component.proxy the reference to that control panel in. So we use the component.proxy function now to get access to the control panel to get the reference of it and then store it in the panel variable. Next up is we want to address a single module of that control panel. We can do that so we can uh, by just storing it with uh, in our variable and then use the panels can I, I mean we can have a look at that the panel as you might you can see has a get module function the get module function takes an x uh, an integer value an x value a y value and the panel value and returns a actor so if we're gonna try that out, we can say, okay, we're gonna call the get module function now of the panel. But what uh, what parameters do we need to provide there? So the last value of them describes which panel do we want to use. So the bottom panel here um, would be the panel zero. This would be would be the panel one, and this would be the panel two. So with the last value of those three, we would describe which of these panels we want to address. The other two values are now the, uh, like the coordinates in this coordinate group. So if you look at the panel like that, you can uh, view it as a co uh, like a normal two-dimensional coordinate system. The origin is in the bottom left corner, and uh, the x value goes into uh, like the x axis goes to the right, and the y value goes up. So if we want to address now this uh, green button down there, this would be at the coordinates 0, 0, because we start here with 0. Not like 1 with a race, no, this is 0. Because this is not related to Lua itself, this is generally game mechanics, or mechanics generally, and that may change with other languages, and usually programming languages start a race also with a zero. Lewis are a little bit different, so just be aware that here we start with zero in terms of addressing the modules and the coordinate system, and we use one when we're gonna use arrays in Lua. So this push button is located at zero, zero. X value zero, Y value zero. When we want to address the stop button, you might uh, figure out, okay, hold on, this is now at four different coordinates, and you can use each of these coordinates to address the same stop button module. So the stop button module will be able to be addressed if you use for the x value a 1 and for the y value a 0. The same case is you can address the same stop button if you use for the x value a 1 and for the y value a 1, because that would be the place up there. You can also use the x value 2 and the y value 0, then we would still address the same stop button because that would be down there. And you can uh, further uh, go further up, you can say you use for the x value 2 and for the y value 1, that would be that corner over there, and you would still able to address the same stop button module. We also have now the, uh, the switch button, uh, the switch module. So this is like has the size of one by two, and you can just simply toggle the switch here on and off. You also have here the potentiometer module, which allows you to rotate it anti-clockwise or clockwise. You also have like the stop button modules; you can just press them when hitting uh, the E or the this interact button by satisfactory. Can use those to then switch all sorts of things. In a later update, we will introduce um, a larger variety of different modules you can use and a different kind of modular control panel. You can also use like placing them on walls and stuff.
This over there is uh, not be, uh, you cannot interact with it, but instead it is able to display some simple text. There is also this guy here, which is the screen module, which works just like a normal large screen or a screen driver. We haven't talked about those, but those allow you to draw essentially way fancier graphics. But this text, uh, but is very complex, uh, but is rather complex to use. And the text mm, display here, on the other hand, is very simple because you can ju you just say display that text and it does that for you. So this is uh, the text display and as you can see it's rather large so you have a lot of different things you can use it to address with. For now we're gonna focus mainly on the button and on the text display. So if you're gonna uh, look at the uh, button's interface, you can see the button has here, for example, a set color function. This color function, uh, this set color function allows us to change the color of the button head like this. So uh, right now it's uh, it's green and is rather bright. So the emission, the light emission is rather high. We want to change it now that the button uh, like is red instead of green. For that. We go into the uh, we go into our computer and we now try to address the module. So as we have already learned, it is on the coordinate zero zero because it's in the bot uh, in the bottom left corner, which is directly the origin of our coordinate system. And we're also on the bottommost panel of the large control panel, so that's why we have to provide a third zero here to tell it that we're going to use that panel instead. Next up is in the module, we're gonna print that now. You will see this is now our push button module, or module button it's also called. So we're gonna try to, uh, we can now interact with it. So we can say module, set color, and now we're gonna provide it for different color values. So RGB values from zero to one are, are they arranging. So we say, okay, we want to make it red. So we say red is one, uh, green is a zero, uh, and a blue is zero and then we also have an emission value which is the light intensity it emits we're gonna uh, put that to a five or whatever so if we're gonna run that code now you can see our button now turned red this can be for example uh, used for um, displaying different things so like different uh, d uh, displaying a status and stuff without the requirement of uh, uh, like just text or a colorful screen display which is rather complex to use with that you can just uh, uh, like provide a simple indication light or color to further differentiate what state a given program is in for example we now, for example, also want to display some stuff on text display module. For that, we're gonna have to look at the different functions and properties this uh, display provides. We can find out that it provides a text function, uh, a text property, and a size property, as well as a monospace property. So these are different uh, properties we uh, we have to use. The text property is used to just simply provide the um, text to show. Um, uh, like what we're gonna want to show size is like the font size of the text we're gonna display, and you can also switch to a monospace font if you if you enable the monospace property. So for that we're gonna just simply say module.txt. So we're gonna set now the text value to hello, for example. And we're gonna, if we're gonna run that text now, uh, code now, as you can see the text is rather small in the display. So we want to size that now up. For that we're gonna say module.size and then provide a larger value. We want to have the like uh, like the font size. We want to change it now. We use the size property for that. For example, let's uh, let's take 25 and as you can see, it's larger. Let's try to increase it even further. So like if we're gonna go overboard, for example, with something like 100. Okay, this is not even overboard. Um, you can see it's it gets even larger. If we now enable monospace, you can see the font of the display changes. On a side note, please don't worry if you are on a light offset when trying to interact with those different modules. The reason for that is coffee sense to use, ordering not to fix that issue, but it's not really something uh, fixed networks um, creates that issue it's it's something by the game itself so just be aware that if you like uh, directly point to a module you don't interact with it you probably have to 
few of it a little bit above the further you go away the more correct this uh, will be but when you are rather near it it's very strange and far away so be aware of that now you may wonder how we can get the button to actually work right now when we press the button nothing happens we want to we want that something happens for this we have to rely on the network signals the network signals are a system that allows components like these or anything in the game you can address with a computer to emit so-called network signals when you uh, when such a thing emits a network signal it adds an entry in the signal queue of all the listening computers. So at default, nothing will happen. But if we now have a computer that then says, uh, that then actively says, okay, I want to listen to this button so that it receives those signals when that button gets pressed, then the computer will get aware of that uh, signal that got triggered. So with that we decrease essentially stuff that happens in the background and the computers are a little bit more at ease. So that means you have to actively tell the computer that it wants to listen to the button and only then when you press the button the computer will actually know that the button got pressed. But we still don't have the actual information that the button got pressed. So as said when such a signal got triggered or emitted so that a computer has now created an entry in a queue so each signal that got triggered gets then added into a queue for each computer that listens so each computer has its own queue of signals and all the uh, send uh, like all the sending components the computer listens to when these sending components or things emit a signal an entry will be added at the end of that queue. The computer program can now go in there and say, okay, queue, do you have an entry? If that's the case, it takes the entry out, of, uh, it, it takes the uh, first entry that ever got, uh, the first entry that got put into the queue and returns it and then can process it and do some stuff. Like, uh, if an item got transferred, you can now check what item type it was, or, or, or stuff like that. And with that, you can do that. And uh, it gets then removed out of the queue. So that means the computer program now does its stuff. And then it reaches again that point and says, okay, queue, what is the next, uh, what is the next signal in that queue? Give me that and remove it out of the queue. It, uh, it gets then the data of that signal, pro can process it, and then can do the things all over again. So this is essentially then pulling those signals. There's a very important difference. So instead, the com like, in like a different approach would be the computer constantly asks the button itself, do you have a state change? Do you have a state change? Do, do you have a state change? That would require a lot, a lot of stuff to happen at the same time. And is a very um, process intensive and slow. So instead, the computer just asks the queue, has there happened anything? And if that's the case, it gets the data. And if not, we will talk about that in a second. For now, be aware that this queue is has a limited size. So if you if a computer now listens, for example, to item transfers of a container or something, and then each item that gets transferred creates a signal. And the computer does not, uh, does nothing, and the queue gets filled with those signals because we want to uh, we want to know about each of those transfers. The queue will reach its limit. I don't know what the exact value is, but let's just assume it's about one thousand. So if we say, okay, um, uh, we have now over uh, we have now one thousand signals in our queue. Any kind of further signals of any component we have listened to as computer those signals will be ignored until there is again space within the queue 
EG, something got uh, like the computer actually pulled something out of the queue, processed it so that the entry got removed and we only have 999 entries in the queue. So we have one space for one further signal. That That's the next signal that's, uh, that gets triggered. So if the queue is full and something happens, the computer will never know about that. If, it's, if that's a problem, the components uh, provide usually functions that allow you to still kind of work around that issue. But uh, for now, like especially in this case with, uh, with, button, uh, with these button inputs, that's not the case. So be aware that the signal queue may be full. So the question is now how can we do that? For that we have to use the event library of the Lua runtime that is directly provided. So as already said, first of all we have to tell the computer that we or the component or in this case the button that we want to listen to it. That when stuff happens uh, over the over that button, like a player presses the button, we want to get notified about that. Like push signals on a on a mobile phone or, or something like that so we do that with the events uh, of the event library the listen function so the listen function now takes just simply any kinds of references um, like an actor reference to our push button module here and that will then essentially tell the computer okay when something happens on the button we will know that an entry will be created in our queue if we don't do that no entries will be added in our signal queue and nothing will happen with this uh, signal entries will be added into our signal queue now we want to actually get like the signal out of there so for that we have said okay we want to do it over and over again we haven't talked about those for now um we will do it uh, we will do that at a later point for now let's just say a while true do and everything between those two lines will be repeated over and over and over again okay so our what we want to do now is we want to say okay is there a uh, is there now an entry is there now an entry in the signal queue if so, give me the data. So we can just simply print that data out and the function we have to use is the pull function. With the pull function we say, okay, pull the, um, pull the next entry out of the queue. Okay, and return the data. So if we're gonna do that now, um, you will see nothing happens. So when we now go over here and press, uh, press the button, like a couple of times, you can see we have a couple of trigger, um, uh, we have a couple of things attached. So the event.pull always returns two properties, two, ver uh, two values we can store even in variables. So the first one is the event name. The event name in this case is trigger. Okay. The second one is the signal sender. So imagine you listen to multiple different buttons. You want to be able to differentiate those buttons. What, uh, what button got actually triggered so we already know okay we got a different module like the stop button module um, module on get module 1.0.0 uh, uh, 100 um, we have to listen to that too so we can just simply do a event.listen call o again or we just do this here instead so With that now we listen to both modules and when we're gonna do that now you can see for now you cannot really differentiate between those so if you now press uh, many times the stop button and then like once the push button you will see okay we can differentiate a little bit like module stop button module button but there but if we have again further normal model button, we won't be able to differentiate those. So um, the way of doing that is with the set, uh, second variable here, the second value that get returned by the pull, uh, by the uh, by that pull function when there is a signal, and that uh, variable is essentially just a reference to that module or to that re uh, to that thing that triggered the signal. So we can just simply check. Is uh, is that uh, is that thing that sent the data the same as module one? So we're gonna print now. Okay, is the sender that's why s is the sender the same? Double equal is uh, equal operation. We check. Okay, is all those two values the same? 
and the other value is module 1. So if we're gonna do that now, we can see, okay, when we now press a couple of times the stop button module and then once the push button and then once the stop button again. You will see we got a lot of falls because we pressed the stop button often, then once the normal push button and then again once the stop button. But like we check, is it actually just the push button? Only if it's the push button, we actually return true. So for that you can differentiate between the different senders. If you have the same kind of sender, you can still differentiate those. Um, even though the, the signal name in E, in the variable E in this case, is the same. Important to notice that each signal may have additional information. So if you look for example at, uh, at the on mouse up event of the graphical proce processing unit, you can see it additionally provides um, X, Y and button values. So these will be added after those two variables we have just seen. So if we go over the code, in this case we would be able to get that data over there, so X, Y, and button. And then we can uh, have those stored in our variable there. So for this piece of code, you don't need to fully understand it yet, but for now, um, we listen to the normal push button and the stop button, and we then get the signal, uh, we, uh, we then try to get the signals out of it. And we check, okay, is the, is, is the press button the push button? We make the push button head red. And if it's the stop button, we make the uh, push button green again. So if you're gonna run that piece of code now, you can see, okay, it's green. So you're gonna press the push button, it's red now. Stop button, green. If we press the stop button multiple times, it stays green. And if we're gonna go back to the push button, it, go, it turns red again. So with that, we can now differentiate between those and make something happen when we press those buttons. With a piece of code like this, you may wonder why don't uh, I set like, uh, the while true will make that uh, the code will uh, X, uh, the code in here will uh, repeat over and over and over again. But why does this not happen in this case right now? We can see nothing happens. Meep will uh, never gets printed. The reason for this is that the event.pull function blocks. It uh, stops, it halts the execution until at least one signal is available in the signal queue that it's then able to return that value. So that's why Meep does not get printed until at least one signal got received. It then repeats the code and uh, since the signal got removed out of the queue, the queue is now empty and it reaches the event.pull again. So the event.pull again blocks until something happens. This is very important and this allows you to optimize your code way better. This will reduce FPS lags you may call um, you may cause with those kinds of infinite loops you can also provide a number or integer value to this event.pull function if you provide a zero this whole thing of blocking does not happen but what you may ask okay panna what does it then return when there is no signal available in the queue is simply nothing so you can see our E variable here will then just simply be nil. So if we run that code now, you can see it spams everything with nil. Because it's a, a set, it never blocks, it does everything over and over and over again. It is not able to find any kind of signal, so that's why it uh, returns, uh, returns constantly nil. So if there would be at some point a signal in there, then the E obviously will be filled with the data, uh, or the variables will obviously be filled with the data of that signal but only once, and then again, it got removed out of the queue, queue will be empty again, so again, returning nil. So for this, you can also check, okay, is the first va value returned by the event.pull actually valid and not nil? Because if it's nil, we know, okay, no signal has happened in the meantime. This also allows to kind of create a uh, delay function, because if you now provide values over the integer value zero, even 0.0. .0. This is a different value than 0. 0.0, .0 means, okay, we stop the execution for this tick, and the next game loop tick, essentially, we try again to get a... Uh, we then say, okay, now try get, give me a signal. Is there a signal? No? Then we're gonna return nil. But 
uh, if there uh, if there is a signal then we just return that data but if we reach that and there is no signal available it says okay we're gonna wait till the next game loop essentially and everything about that is then just simply at uh, uh, time in seconds so it means if we run that code now you can see it only creates one message per second so it says okay I'm gonna try to get a signal out of the queue for about one second and after, if I don't have any signal available to return after one second I just return null so I was not able to find a signal. You can use any kind of value there if you want to, no negative values obviously though. Um, but as said this allows you to further uh, check uh, your stuff and like keep uh, parallel processing going even though you're listening to signals for example. So with that you can say, okay, I'm gonna try a retry every second to get a new signal and if I'm not able to get one if within that one second I can do some other stuff like getting some data from containers and updating a display or something and don't have to wait for any kind of user input or something, whatever I want to do. So with that you can like say, okay, I'm gonna uh, try out a little bit and if not able well then just return nil and I can do the, something else. This is also called timeout. So this value is also called the timeout value of this poly, uh, for, of this uh, signal pulling here. This was again a lot to take in about uh, the network signals and the model control panels. I hope you enjoyed it and learned a little bit on how to interact with some stuff of fixed networks. Be aware that many many different things might have signals even with return values like the switch module. Uh, that one has one return value. And uh, just check them out in the reflection view. Um, and everything that's left to say is I was Paul Codonum from Codedy from Mispats and I say bye bye until next time and as always Keep coding!